Hi, welcome to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Thanks for joining the conversation. Show. We are here in Kauai live at Ka- Kauai Comic Con. Thousands Ooh. of people. <laughs> My special guest today is Moana McAdams, who is here to talk a lot about Hawaiian culture. We were talking off air already about diversity and inclusion, but also originally from Kauai. Is that yes. correct? Yes, originally from Kauai, Wailua Homesteads, Kapa'a High School, and I'm really excited to be here at Comic-Con. It's a little bit of, uh, you know, going full circle, which is awesome, Um, and our community is the best, so it's always good to be home. Moana, do you want to share anything uh, fascinating that, that uh, what else you experienced today? Maybe at your panel, you had a lot of kids? Oh, yeah, so at our panel, we actually didn't have a lot of kids. We had some adults, though, but... um, (laughs) So we, we talked a little bit about Hawaiian culture and why it's important and what, I, you know, what I've been doing with my children's book series, as well as some of the challenges working with Disney um, in terms of trying to put a little bit more backstory into existing characters. They're not so much a fan of that if it's not coming out of the movie, but you know, it's like it's little baby steps. Um, you do what you can and... Um, you know, hopefully each time it's like a little bit more and a little bit more. They're very open to the thematics uh, of like different themes of Hawaiian culture and things like that. But I try to put to um, story the more about the parents and about Nani because I love her character. She's one of my favorites. But they weren't such a fan of that. So I was like, okay, well, let me see what other, you know, characters I can use to convey the story that I wanted to tell. Yeah. Ooh, we're getting the dirt on Disney right here, everybody. The dirt on Disney. I actually have to say, earlier in the day, I was talking a lot about the Disney experience as well. Yeah. And being that I worked with Disney in the 90s versus now, and I feel like there would be a lot of difference in the way the film was put together and run. For instance, like I did all the martial arts choreography and all of the stunt movements and things like that. Mm-hmm. And the stunt coordinator or fight coordinator was a very nice, mind you, but you know, white British man. And he got all the credit as the stunt coordinator, which I think in 2024, they probably wouldn't have gone that route. I think they probably would have pushed for authenticity. For example, when I did Phantasmic, I choreographed the Mulan and Shang section for the show that is now live at uh, uh, Hollywood Studios. And they were very insistent that I choreograph and that I was given credit and people knew that I worked on this. Whereas in the 90s, they didn't really care so much and they had kind of a, a coordinator who was uh, very notorious for other films, but definitely did not know anything about Chinese martial arts and admitted so to me, but yet that's who got screen credit. So yeah. we've come a little ways, but we still have a long ways to go. Yeah, but I think definitely I'm, the team I'm working with on Lilo and Stitch, the editor is uh, Nate Cosby, and he has been really good about making sure that, you know, I think it's the first time they brought in a cultural consultant role and then also giving me creativity to be um, a developmental editor as well. For those who are familiar with Greg Pak's work, um, he's actually the writer on the Lilo and Stitch series, and he's very generous and super opening and really a great advocate for the minority and underrepresented communities and making sure our perspectives are in there. Love it, love it. And okay, I have to say, you sh- your name is Moana. I'm sure it's not the first time you've heard this. Like, oh, your name is Moana, just like Disney's Moana? <laughs> yes, just like her. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I, I get this question a lot. Like, are, you mean like Disney Moana? Yes, yes. But were, were you named after her? Like, um... <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, but she's a little older than me. <laughs> That's right, she's my older sister. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Is there actually, uh, because I know that you know a lot about genealogy and you, you did a podcast on names and things, is there a meaning behind the name Moana as well or is there anything significant why it's uh, Disney, ch- do you know why Disney chose the name Moana or? I don't know why they chose it but Moana is actually, I think what they were trying to do with Moana is encapsulate a lot of the different Pacific Islander cultures 
and Moana is a name that is common across those. Um, the meaning of Moana itself, um, at a very surface level, is ocean. But in Hawaiian culture, the words have nuance to it. So Moana is actually like the depths of the ocean. And for those of you who don't know, like Pacific Islander cultures, obviously very oceanic fo focused cultures and very strong navigators throughout our history. And the ocean is what actually unites us. So that's, to me, that's what makes it important. Yeah, no, thank you. Actually, even many of our audience members and myself included, I think that is the problem. We don't get to learn about Asian America, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander stories. We don't get to learn about any of these stories growing up. And that's why I worked on, you know, inclusion in our history in schools. But I think beyond that, the work you're doing, especially to a broader audience, like comic books and storytelling and children's books, it's so, so important because these stories will be lost. And I know that you were talking earlier about Disney and working on um, Lilo and Stitch as a comic writer and trying to tell authentic stories. Are there certain stories that you've come across in your research that you feel like, I wish I had known this growing up and that, or that, that is like one that you're compelled to usually tell? I would say like just about every, <laughs> just about every Pacific Islander story is, is fascinating. So in my research, I read a lot of historical books written by Hawaiian authors, also some authors that come from outside of our community. Um, you know, we hear the Maui story and that was what was fa um, featured in the Moana film. But there are so many depths of uh, different portrayals of Maui. But he isn't, you know, the only superhero, right? Like in Hawaii, we have Kanaloa, which is the ocean god. We have Kane, uh, Lono. Um, and so, so what I try to put into my books are taking things that are like rooted in culture, but trying to make it a spin on it that makes it more modern so that the kids, the, the younger generation now, can relate to it in a way. Because a lot of the fandoms that I think are, you know, are are out there, there are cultural elements into it, it's just not as apparent to, to the reader. Yeah, and I've noticed, especially since I've been working so hard on that AAPI history inclusion, yeah. AAPI NH, all of it, right? It's especially Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities, I think even more so are excluded and there's a lot of misrepresentation. Do you know or why why you think that might be because I do find that even in my research it's like you can find a little bit about Asian American history especially East Asian maybe even some Southeast Asian but I think especially that Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander element we really find that missing and then misunderstood and misrepresented yeah is there a reason you think that's the case well so I, I think there's many reasons for this a lot of it is it just wasn't taught in school I mean I know when I was a kid even living in Hawaii, right? It wasn't a part of the curriculum. A lot of our history subjects, you know, like the classroom, it was all American history. I definitely didn't see a whole ton of Hawaiian history at the time. We didn't have the immersion schools that we have now that are giving that exposure for our kids. And so with part of the big reason with my stories and anything that I work on is trying to bring that authenticity um, into the story to help our children feel like they are seen, not just on the surface, but the stories that are being told, things that they can relate to at, at, you know, in their childhood, in their families, the dynamics, you know, all of those types of things. And then of course the history piece is, is super important. I think Pacific Islanders, they're kind of a minority within a minority because there are such diverse cultures within the Pacific itself. And then when you're in like, other settings where folks don't even because it's if it's not taught in Hawaii it's I'm sure it's not being taught in the continent right um, and so part of what I like to do with my my stories is kind of be the a part of the solution to that problem giving our perspective of you know what we feel like is important to us as a community and then also hopefully inspiring the next generation or even other writers who have thought about you know, I don't see myself in a story. Um, I would like to, you know, share that more and like just pretty much show that like there are examples of people who have done it. I never thought I would be a writer. I actually didn't start writing until probably six years ago. Didn't have any formal training, like none of that. I've just kind of been learning, talking to others in the community, learning kind of the business and process of it, but then keeping my work 
focus on my community because that's what's important to me. Yeah, I love that so much. I, I can't emphasize how much and how often I've heard kids and adults because of course you know Mulan was a long time ago now come up to me and say yeah. wow it was so amazing yes. to see a character that looked like me yes. or that ate the food I ate or had that yes. same feeling and I can't imagine just even with Lilo and Stitch and Moana how many people have said wow what a what a breath of fresh air and how much of a relief it was to feel a connection but also to be seen yeah. and to feel represented and even if it's not 100% accurate, yes. we'll take it, right? We'll take something. Something is better than nothing and it's a starting point. Definitely. And I think for us, we really are pushing for that starting point and to just build on top of that. Now, you also host the Moana Nui podcast mm -hmm. and I believe I'm gonna guess what prompted you was to continue these stories and everything. Yeah. And I know as a podcast host, I started after 2016, so it's been a while, but I've learned a lot about myself personally as a podcast host. What have you learned about yourself hosting a podcast? Oh man, so when I first started my podcast, like I'm not one who likes to be the center of attention. So like before I started my podcast, sitting in front of you guys right now, my heart would be going like this. <laughs> Like, and I'm still not a huge fan of being in front of people, but it's just part of the business. It's part of, you know, if you want your stories to be told, you have to get up in front of people, right? And so the podcast is great, though. We actually started it just after COVID. You know, we couldn't go to cons anymore. Everybody was isolated, right? But for me, like my husband and I, we self-publish our own series, The Wildcard Chronicles. And so we're a part of the independent comic community, which, you know, in, in Comic-Cons, we don't often get featured, but we wanted people to better understand the creators behind the stories, what drives them to create, why did they create, and their experiences, and help fans get to know them better as people, and why their stories are awesome. So we started it as like features for small, small publishers or small creators, and then it kind of grew. Like we now have multiple segments. We go to different comic cons, Dragon Con in Atlanta. Uh, we're headed to San Diego in July. Um, yeah, so we, we go all over the place. I have teams that help and, you know, just like this Comic-Con, you can't do it by yourself. It's, it's, it's all about community. Like everything in my work is about the community and how we can help each other to like make our dreams come true, whatever that might be. Like I, I know we talked about Mulan earlier and I'm glad you mentioned that because she was a character and I was like, oh my gosh. It was like close, like it wasn't, she wasn't Hawaiian, yeah. but she definitely wasn't the typical blonde yeah. hair, fair skinned, <laughs> yeah. you know, princess. 100%. So um, yeah, a podcast really gives you an opportunity to connect with people, build relationships. A lot of the opportunities that I have now is through my podcast and the people that I've met. Ming was on my show, you know, like Aaron, you know, I've, he's, he's brought me into this space. So I'm really grateful for all of the different folks here. Well, I know why you're nervous. I mean, there's thousands of people here at Kauai <laughs> Comic Con, and so obviously the nerves can be going. But honestly, I was talking earlier, and I really wasn't kidding. Like, I prefer cons where I am up with the community, being Same. able to speak one-on-one. -on -one. Like, San Diego's great. Yeah. It is a mess, but I much prefer coming to Kauai any day over <laughs> San Diego Comic Con. <laughs> and that is, I am not lying. <laughs> For sure. It's, 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 it's just too, I, I just really love the community here. Same. And when Aaron actually told me he was starting a Comic Con in Kauai, so I said, amazing. And he said, well, you know, our community never gets a Comic Con yes. here. They don't get to share in the culture. They, some of our kids and families can't afford to island hop to even the other islands that are so close by. And I thought it was such a noble thing. We were teasing Aaron earlier about yeah. all the things and how amazing, but in all honesty, like just kudos and thank you so much to Aaron for bringing this here because it allows not only your community to come together, but for outsiders to come in and visit yes. and also see how wonderful and amazing the community here is so i'm grateful to be here as well and just so happy that we have this opportunity yeah i'm glad that you mentioned you know that Kauai usually doesn't get to experience these things um even with my children's book series the adventures of nakoa and nohea i wrote i decided to write those and base it here in Kauai because a lot of our cultural books pacific islander books native hawaiian books typically focus on Oahu and Maui and the Big Island and Kauai doesn't get a lot of love but what I wanted to do like I'm from Kauai I'm going to represent my home and I'm proud to do that because you know 
we know a lot about Kamehameha and you know those chiefly lines, but I think what some people forget is that Kauai is the island that was never conquered. You know, that had to be done through negotiation. So like how strong was our island at the time? And the first Hawaiian settlers were actually came to Kauai and those lineages were like seen as, were, they were actually sought after by the chiefs of the other islands. In order to strengthen their communities, they had to come to Kauai. So a lot of those things is what like further inspires me in my work. Thank you so much. I'm getting a history lesson today. <laughs> this is exactly what I what I wanted. On my podcast, I'm very selfish. I only interview people I want to learn from and who are fascinating. So I really get all the benefit and, and our audience as well. But thank you for sharing that. I actually had no idea that was fascinating to me. It's funny because Aaron has been to a lot of the cons that yeah. I've been at. And he always tells people, oh, I'm from Kauai, Kauai. And, and when they've heard of it, he's shocked because he goes, oh, I'm, we're always kind of forgotten and yeah. a smaller island. And, and it made me so like heartbroken to hear that because I had no idea that that was the dynamic because I know him and I knew this is where he was from. I never understood, but it makes sense that a lot of the bigger islands get a lot more of the love, a lot more of the cons, a lot more of the, so even like you said earlier with the Pacific Islanders, like, you know, kind of within a community, within a community, mm -hmm. within a, even within the Hawaiian communities, you have kind of a hierarchy of either being forgotten or underrepresented. And so yep. I think it's so important. So we love that you are helping, you know, correct that. So thank you so much. Uh, I want to talk about really quickly also on the podcast lately, I saw that you were hosting so many things on lineage and like I said, genealogy earlier and name origins. I've always found that fascinating. And I will not try to pronounce any of the Hawaiian things that I see and read. There's a lot of apostrophes and um, I just never want to butcher anything, but I find it fascinating because I think, again, it's something that I don't know, like just by polling, maybe you know generationally, but how many speak people maintain the language and the, the art, you know, there's just so much to it. Like as generations goes on, mm -hmm. does that die out? And so what have you discovered as you've been having these podcasts and talking and kind of going deeper into that lineage and name origins and, you know, that whole cultural dynamic? Oh my gosh. So, I mean, if you, I mean, you guys are, you live in Hawaii, you know how complicated our family dynamics can get, <laughs> like who's related to who and what family and you know, all of that. So, Mo'oku Auhau is our name for genealogy. Um, I'm not the expert, which is why I'm, I love the podcast because I get to bring experts on so I can learn and so other people can learn. But so like a lot of the different chiefly lines, they intersected and it's so hard to keep track because we have long names too and I'm like okay and some of them are they might be like the um who's the one I'm thinking of Kame Ili Hiva and then there's number one and then there's number two and number three but they're not necessarily all in the same you wouldn't think it was like mom daughter granddaughter sometimes it's like mom and then cousin and then cousin of a cousin and so that yeah it just it gets confusing very very quickly but genealogy is definitely important in knowing your roots for myself you know i i enjoy it i, I do it for my family because i want to know who our ancestors are it's important for us to know this um and as i was doing my research i discovered that like my um i would say seven seven generations before me, um, they were actually part of the advisors to King Kamehameha um, during the formation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. One of my ancestors was in, within Hawaiian government and he did a lot of the land titles and his, his name is all over the place. So it's, it's very interesting to know because like I happen to work within government now and just seeing the connections like, oh, this is why I am the way I am. I became a leader because my ancestors were leaders. Yeah. And how do I, you know, how do I translate this back now into the current community and help to continue to build upon that legacy? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for doing that. That's amazing. I am also here. So obviously any excuse to come to Hawaii, I will take. But it was really <laughs> great that Aaron invited us back and we're really happy to be here. And like I said, this is my favorite island, not just because it's the only island I've been to, but also because of the family and everyone that I've met. I just have such a connection. But I was also very excited because I'm jumping over uh, from, from this island on Monday and I'm going to Maui. Okay. And I spoke with a really lovely podcast guest last year, Ronald Sombrano, uh, who is one of the, the people who lost their home in the Lahaina fire. Yes. And I had a really amazing conversation with him. He was so open and 
willing to share his story and I was just heartbroken. And I'm, you know, I'm in Florida, so we're on the news a lot for really not good not things. I'm sorry on behalf of all of Florida, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm frustrated about is the news media cycle constantly doesn't cover, I think, what's important. The, the media doesn't show what we really should be learning about or hearing about. And I don't think I've heard about the fires since last year, right? And I know yep. from speaking with community members there that it is very much still a disaster. There, yep. There's been no progress made. It's been problematic. So I was really grateful that I had the opportunity to, of course, come here and do all the fun things, but I'll be going on Monday to volunteer with the community. I'm doing like a Taiji wellness mental health workshop with our uh, community there and nice. some of the special needs community that we connected with. So I was really grateful to, and honored to be able to go out there and, you know, just share whatever I can and, and be whatever support because I, I also am going to podcast again with, with Ronald because people forget, yeah. unfortunately, people forget. You all live so close, so I'm sure you're a little more connected, but mm. it's so often people forget. And I saw on your website, you had so much listed about supporting and local, you know, businesses and things like that. But what can you share about, you know, the fact that the aftermath of what's happened, even just for Hawaii as a whole, because even if you're not on Maui, it's affected everyone everyone feels or knows somebody that had yeah. lost yeah so i mean i have family on maui who were impacted by the fires you know job loss it's, it's compounding challenges that the community already faces today but even though being away from that family you know we, we worked with a nonprofit who was boots on the ground in maui yeah. a lot of the initial aid that went there was not, it wasn't, um, you know, the ones that you would think, right? Like FEMA and Red Cross, they were there, but they were, the aid was slow to come in. Yeah. And so a lot of it came from Molokai. So what I was doing, because I live on the continent now, I was trying to raise money from the different businesses that I know and have relationships with. So we were able to raise money to bring in MacBooks and things that uh, we, we, Huacamana had like um, mental health care workers, kind of like what you're doing working within the community, but e equipping them to be able to go in, communicate. Um, we also donated books from, you know, our children's book series. And then we've been working with some of the other Native Hawaiian businesses on the continent to help. Um, that, that's really what I saw during that time is no matter where we were, the community was trying to do whatever was in their power. We were also working with um, a halau or hula group in Arizona. Um, and they were raising uh, funds to purchase supplies. And a lot of the challenges were like logistically. So, you know, initially we were trying to send goods in, but then they were being held up for, don't even know why they were being held up. So we ended up just raising money and putting it into the community groups that we know were on the ground, Maui Medics and, um, shoot, I'm blanking on the other one right now. But the, but the groups that we knew were tangibly helping right. the families were, you know, you could see the immediate impact. Yes. And it's really important in those vulnerable situations because it's really easy for those people to take get taken advantage of. And, you know, people just do things just to exploit, quite frankly. But being a part of the community, it's really helpful because, you know, when you are from a small knit community, it's hard to trust the intentions of people, regardless of like how, it could be a, a totally good intention. Um, but sometimes it turns out not that way. And so, especially when you're talking about the Hawaiian community who has been exploited for a while, building trust and having that with the community is huge. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's just it's just unfortunate that when there is tragedy, there are people that take advantage and then we just have to hopefully, hope for the best, but that there are protective organizations in place that can help. And so I'm gonna definitely list that on the website as well, some of your links that you know, people it. who wanna be able to help when I was in Florida, we were like, who do we send funds to? What do we yeah. do? Because not nothing against the bigger orgs, no, but yeah. we want to make sure that the help is going directly to those in yes. need. And it's really hard to know, right? And even in, in Hawaii, I'm sure people were trying to connect with family and ask them directly because you can't really go off what, like the news list places to help out. Yeah. You can't go <laughs> off of that because you just want to make sure it's happening in the most direct way as possible and most impacting way. So unfortunately there is still so many issues that are happening. So I will be you know, finding out on Monday and following up and 
hopefully share more of the stories that yeah. are happening because this is just like what you and I have been talking about this whole time. If we don't share our stories, our history is not preserved. If we don't learn from history, we make the same mistakes yep. and we just see it happening all around the country. But, um, you know, to kind of wrap up, maybe on a happier note, you know, go back to Lilo <laughs> and Stitch, but <laughs> I didn't want this to be a downer. But, but it's serious, right? Mm -hmm. These things are serious. And unfortunately, history is also always not always pretty. Yep. It's not always the shiny moments and the happy moments. Uh, my husband and I talk about history a lot and yeah. listen to a lot of podcasts. And history is usually told by the victors and the winners. And that's not always the most accurate portrayal. But yeah. is there anything else that you feel our listeners, because we have our wonderful live audience, but we also have podcast listeners that honestly know nothing about Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander history or culture. Is there one thing that you would like our listeners to take away from the conversation? Oh man, um, I guess I would just say- things. <laughs> Many things, share it all. <laughs> that like aloha is two-sided, right? There's the, the embracing thing and then there's the protecting thing. And as a community, it's important for each of us to understand our role um, and to, you know, not just be all about an individualistic person. Um, I, you know, I kind of see it both sides because I live in and outside of Hawaii. But aloha is, is a huge part of our culture and we should definitely continue to do that. By the same token, like you have a lot of value that you bring um, to the world. If there is a story that you want to tell, you know, embrace it. Seek out others, like come talk to me. You know, if, if there are things that you would like to do, if you have interest and you need some tips, um, I can connect you if I don't know folks, you know, like if I'm not the one who has the answers, I'll do my best to connect you to people who can help you out, however that might look like for you. My ultimate goal really is to bring more people who look like me, who come out of our under, underrepresented communities and to have seats at tables to influence this storytelling and bring more authenticity into it. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much to Moana McAdams again and Kauai Comic Con. Thank you for hosting this amazing event. We were actually, I think, the last panel of the day. Yep. So we are closing out strong here <laughs> on the Sifu Mimi Chan podcast. Thanks to our amazing live studio audience. <laughs> All right, everybody, I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you so much, yeah, Moana. Thank this you. was such an honor and pleasure. Likewise. And um, we'll see you all next year. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Appreciate you. <laughs> That's all for today's episode. Thanks for listening to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Please subscribe and rate my podcast on your platform of choice and leave a review. You can become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash Sifu Mimi Chan to help keep this podcast going. Follow me and interact on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan on Instagram or Facebook.